Read along with me. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence I know you not whence ye are. Then from Esther chapter number one, verses one through four, and verses ten and twelve. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. That in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan in the palace. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and even the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred fourscore years, a hundred and four score. This is a hundred and eighty days of partying. Verse number 10, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded seven chamberlains that served in thy presence of Ahasuerus the king to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. But the queen Vastai refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and uh, his anger burned within him. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to preach on the subject today, trophy wife. I read an article that was... Uh, that was written by an Ashley Merriman in the New York Times that had this title, Losing is Good for You. And she went on to say, and if I might just quote, as children return to school this fall and sign up for a New Year's worth of extracurricular activities, parents should keep one question in mind, whether your kid loves Little League or gymnastics, ask the program organizers this, which kids get awards? If the answer is everybody gets a trophy, find another program to put them in. And the article goes on to say that there used to be a day when trophies were a rare commodity. They had to be purchased in special stores with special engravers where that they were given to the very best of the best in order to honor their high achievements and to reward them for their great sacrifices. She went on to say, but something happened during the 1960s, and that is uh, foreign countries begin to mass-produce trinket trophies made of plastic. They were shiny, they were cheap, and so organizations of all kinds could begin to purchase these trophies in mass and hand them out to everybody as just a, uh, a door prize, as it were. Now, in America, uh, we have this thing. It has become now the political correct thing to do, not to ever talk about failure or to talk about loss or to talk about missing the mark, but to reward everyone and to tell them they're great even when they're not doing so great. So those of you children that have been raised under that specter of being praised even when you don't deserve praise, you better thank God while it lasts because it's not going to last forever. And sometimes I wonder what position the next generation will be into when all of a sudden they're called into the boss's office and they're presented with real 
serious deficiency in their job or whatever it is and how they may in fact respond. This has bled over into the church world because it is also very unfashionable and almost offensive to many to suggest that you may not be prepared to meet the Lord when he comes. Quickly, people will challenge a preacher or a Bible study teacher. Are you saying that I'm going to go to hell? And the challenge is palpable, and it's emotional, and it's powerful, and it, and, and it is ready to engage the teacher who would dare say, well, that's a remote possibility. You can't even say that to today's generation because they will not hear it. So hell has become taboo in Christianity. But we must be careful when we begin subtracting basic Bible doctrines from the concept of the Christian faith. He is the author. He is the finisher. Let me remind all of us, as much as we don't want hell to be there, it's there biblically. And there are great uh, 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 curses that come upon those who add to or who take away from the word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't expect you to shout over there being a hell. I've been around long enough to know that. But I just want to lay the foundation that there is the possibility of people not being prepared. Jesus said, they will knock. They will say, let me in. And he will say, I don't know you. So America is the land of the winner. Everybody gets a trophy in America just because you showed up. And so trophies are a given. Heaven is a given. Everybody goes to heaven because God isn't going to send anybody to hell, is he? Well, it depends who you believe God is and where you get your information about who God is. Jesus says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to salvation. Few there be that go that way. And broad is the gate to destruction. And many are going to end up along those lines. And so Americans need affirmation so bad that sports clubs have to offer trophies to everybody just to sign up, just to show up, just to play in the game or to sit on the bench. The American Youth Soccer Organization one year handed out 3,500 awards and trophies every season so that every player on the children's soccer team gets at least one trophy. And so they spend as much as 12% of their national budget buying cheap, cheesy, meaningless, plastic trophies just to make people feel good about themselves. And so living rooms are filled with these participation trophies. And it sends this larger cultural message, and that is you're a winner just by showing up. But let me remind you the scripture that we read today. They showed up all right, but they showed up only to discover that they were grossly unprepared for the coming of the Lord. Why do we have church here at the Pentecostals of Greensboro? We have church to tune our spirit to the sound of that distant trumpet that one day, amen, we will be ready when the Lord comes and will be able to enter into the joys of the Lord with his divine approval and blessing. And so when this young generation shows up at the office, and American business culture has amended their processes greatly to accommodate the next generation. Now they have lounges. They don't need to, they can work at couches with laptops on their knees. They can take breaks whenever they want, right? They can have short work weeks, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point in time, they're going to have to draw the line in order to keep businesses afloat. And, 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 and young people can't, must understand this. You got to do more than show up. 
Because when evaluation time comes and pay raises come around, it's not enough to say, well, I came to work every day. You also have to be able to achieve something. And likewise, for every one of us, we must do more than be Sunday Christians. We must be Monday Christians. We must be Tuesday Christians. We must be Wednesday Christians. We must be Wednesday Christians. We must be Friday and Saturday Christians. Come on, somebody. And so one expert in the psychiatry field by the name of Miss Twinge said these words. Uh, you have to, re every one of us has to realize, even if you're a success, even if you're a winner, you must recognize that you will lose far more often in the things you attempt in life than you will ever succeed. And so the important analysis here is you got to learn how to lose well. You have to learn how to be a good loser. And if you're never confronted with your shortcoming, then you're unprepared for when you're hit in the face with your own deficiency. You don't have the wherewithal to bounce back and to get back in the game and to self-analyze and to improve and to be better at whatever it is that you do. And so my first objective today as your pastor and as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm here to fight for your right to fail. I'm here to tell you, you can make a mistake. And better than that, you can come back from your mistakes. The book of Galatians, Paul said this, if you see your brother overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering your own selves. In other words, when you're confronted with the failure of another brother, remind, look in the mirror, you which are spiritual, and remember when you were in their shoes. The key here is ye which are spiritual. Let me tell you who spiritual people are. Not people who get a trophy just for showing up. But they're people who know how to come back from mistakes themselves. And to recover themselves from the enemy's trap. And to become restored in the Holy Ghost. I'm here to tell you there isn't anything the devil has done that God cannot undo. There isn't any sin that's been committed that God cannot forgive. And then the forgiven one will rise up from the ashes of their disappointment and get out of the sinning business with respect to that area of their lives. Come on, somebody. Does anybody know how to lose? Does anybody know how to come back from failure? Does anybody know how to pray back through? Does anybody know how to get renewed in the Holy Ghost? Oh, put your hands together. And so, we are all natural born inclusivists, especially in Western society. We're unwilling. It is, it is not polite to hurt people's feelings by leaving them out. Well, I agree it's not polite to deliberately hurt people's feelings, but if they don't qualify, you hurt them more by pretending. I cannot tell you how many times I dreaded the choices being made for the football team or the basketball team because I was rarely selected first. It didn't feel good, but in my heart of hearts, I knew I didn't practice like the other guys did. I didn't play every afternoon. I was too busy watching Gilligan's Island. Well, if you're going to sit on the couch and watch Gilligan's Island, be expected to be picked last. <laughs> right. 
And we also, in our country, avoid confrontation at all costs. And thirdly, rejection does so much psychological harm that we ought not to ever allow anyone to experience either being excluded from the group, confronted over their failure, or rejected because they don't qualify. But hear me, just in that one short scripture I read about Jesus, he's guilty of all three things. Strive to enter through the narrow door. Many, I tell you, will try, but they will not be able. And they will say, Lord, let us be a part of the group. And he will say, depart. I don't know who you are. It's a bitter truth, but it's a glorious truth because I came to God by way of failure. I don't know how you got here, but an angel didn't send me a telegram saying, you're so good, we need you at the church. I fell on my face as a hump of defeat in the presence of God and begged for mercy. Failure got me here. Oh, and if you're here today and you feel like a miserable failure, I'm here to tell you it's okay to make a mistake. If you're going to come back from that mistake and learn to be a better person and be a better Christian, then that mistake will minister to your well-being. In the name of Jesus, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel like God wants to pull somebody out of the pit of despair this morning. And so it's disturbing to people when they see a Jesus who will willfully not open the door to those that are standing on the outside wanting to get in. But we have our chance during this life, chance after chance after chance after chance to get in. And so when we are confronted with things about the character and the operation of Jesus Christ that we don't like, well, we have a couple of options. Number one, we can give up on God. We can say, as many millions of people have said, I will not believe in a God who will send anyone to hell. You know, it's a free country. People can believe and think however they want to think. And people can't understand why would God create such a place as hell. First of all, let me tell you, hell wasn't created for human beings. It was created as a punishment for disobedient angels who saw God face to face and should have known better than any other created being that you don't rebel against a deity that you can look at. Huh? They, we, we, people fall because of doubt. The angels didn't fall because of doubt. They fell because of pure out revolt against the authority and the presence of God. Hell was created for that. But because the enemy has, has brought the human race into this thing we call the universal fall, then by default, those that don't prepare themselves by faith and by the, a renewed born-again experience and not prepared to meet the Lord, they end up where they were never intended to go. But I want to remind everyone who has uh, an objection to hell that there are many people under the sound of my voice who wouldn't be here today had they not felt the force of being unprepared when they die. And it only made good sense to them that if there is a heaven and there is a hell, I know where I want to go when I die. And so hell's done a lot of good for a lot of people because it's made them realize uh, I got nothing to lose uh, by serving the Lord. I have a good family. I have a good career. I have a good life. I exercise self-discipline. I'm not controlled by pornography or drugs or immorality. I serve the Lord. I love people. I do good works. What could be wrong with all of that? And then on top, I'm prepared for heaven in the presence of the Lord forever and ever and ever. You can stop believing in the Lord on account of the fact that the Bible says there's a hell. You can do that. Number two, you can set aside that conclusion and you can deny in, in a, some kind of an internal way and believe in a Jesus that, uh, that you feel is completely irrational. There are a lot of people that believe in God, the God that they don't understand at all. 
But I dare say that's to live in a state of cognitive dissonance and being torn between doubt and fear and faith and hope and sorrow. Uh, And that's no way to live either. Thirdly, you can convince yourself that Jesus agrees with you. You don't have to agree with him. He agrees with you. You've ever met anyone who treated Jesus like he was the caddy? Or your best friend over the fence, right? Backyard fence? Or even your personal servant? Or your financial guru? Or whatever. But I want you to know, I have refused to create a Jesus in my own image. I refuse to recast the Jesus that the Bible presents to me. I want the authentic Jesus. I want the biblical Jesus. I want the merciful Jesus. I want the Jesus who does bless, who does forgive, who does heal. I want the Jesus who's the mighty counselor, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the lion of the tribe, amen, the lily of the valley, the bride and the morning star. Isn't that the Jesus you're after today? Well, if you're after that Jesus, he can be found in this place and in this word. And so the English translations of that word strive to enter in at the straight gate has many synonyms. Here's a few of them. Make every effort. Work hard. Struggle. Agonize to get in. You know what that tells me? Trophies aren't for free. If we get there, we're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to admit failure. We're going to have to bounce back from personal disappointment and shame and not blame others and not blame God and not even blame ourselves after we get it under the blood of Jesus, but just get back up on our feet and keep on keeping on because the race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong, but it's to the one who can endure to the end. Anybody, anybody got enough in you to go all the distance for Jesus? And so scientists say, uh, psychological sciences say this, that uh, if those that get trophies that they didn't earn and they just come to expect them, it inoculates the kids against accepting failure and loss. And so what happens is when they do fail or when they're presented with failure, rather than to learn how to bounce back from failure because they've never been trained in failure, they try to cheat their way out. I want to tell you, no cheaters are going to get their way into heaven. And for those of you that think somebody's getting by with something, please remember, we're not in heaven yet. And the good thing is, you and I aren't the cops at the door to stop them from going in. God's fully aware of who's where and who's what. All we have to do is keep ourselves right with God to the best of our ability, and God will take care of it. I don't want to cheat. I want to play honestly. I want to obey the rules of the game, don't you? If children get trophies just for being who they are, what is the incentive for them to improve? and to become better. Garrison Keillor said, loss can be your teacher. He said, failure is essential. It is a form of mortality. Without failure, we would have a poor sense of reality. We are never more humble. We are never more transparent to ourselves and to others and to God than when we are coming back from a brutal failure. We can't hold our head high. We can't boast in our goodness, but all we can do is trust in the mercies of God. And so if someone's saying here, if I had a better life, I think I could be a Christian. No, if you have a lousy life, 
if you have a broken past, if you have a dirty track record, amen, you're in the perfect position to experience what I'm talking about. You have learned enough in your short life of mistakes to when you bounce back, you'll have an education in grace and you'll know, amen, uh, what side, what side your bread is buttered on, so to speak, uh, and you don't ever want to go back to that world of sin ever again. Once you taste of this goodness and this mercy, and it takes you and lifts you out of a world of depression and sin, there's nowhere else to go. They said to Jesus, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Is there anybody that feels that way? I got nowhere else to go. I can't go back. I burn the bridges that lead back to sin. There's nothing there for me. It's only forward in the grace and mercy of God. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so in a Wired Magazine article, uh, the title of the article was Black Friday Mayhem. Everybody knows what Black Friday is. That's the Friday before Thanksgiving holiday when people go turn into shopaholics. Many times they'll camp out in front of a store all night long to take advantage of the blockbuster, doorbuster deals going. And so Wired Magazine did an article on some of the things that happen on the eve of a Black Friday holiday shopping events. 12.01 a.m., Walmart, Rome, New York, and two people ended up in the hospital while another was charged with disorderly conduct minutes after customers were allowed to enter the store's electronics section. They said multiple shoppers were pushed to the ground in front of the store's cell phone display. They went cell phone crazy. And they said after they, inter after they review the security tape, they're going to decide if they're going to indict anybody. Well, that puts a whole new meaning on the word cell phone. It ends up in a cell. Praise God. But people were so cell phone, cell phone madness that they were willing to brawl with each other right there in the store's uh, display area. 12.30 a.m., and impatient shoppers broke into a Hollister store in Soho, apparently because they were sick of waiting in line. In other words, they weren't going to wait till they opened the store. They're going to open the store themselves. 1 a.m., a man at a Walmart in Kissimmee, Florida, was charged with resisting arrest after cops arrived to break up a fight he was having with another shopper at the store's jewelry counter. 1.10 a.m., 20 shoppers at a Walmart in San Fernando Valley had to be treated for injuries after a woman fired off pepper spray multiple times. Get out! Get away from my big green TV! You've seen pictures of the gaggles of people thronging the doorways to get in just because a few products are on sale. Shortly after 2 a.m., two suspects allegedly opened fire on a shopper at a mall in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Jesus said many in that day will enter, strive to enter in to that door, but they will not be able to. Then they won't be able to. Now they're able. Let me tell you something. Heaven is on sale today. There are no obstructions standing between you and Calvary's cross today. The blood of Jesus is ready and willing to cleanse you of every sin in the book today. Oh, hallelujah. And here's the deal. When heaven is on sale, nobody's buying. But when heaven goes off sale, everybody throngs the door and tries to get in. Remember, this parable is in a response to a question. Will there be few that will be saved? It was a question to Jesus about numbers. But Jesus, in his inimitable style, responds to a question about numbers with an answer about time. Why is the door narrow? Because he said it's closing time. And when the proprietor of the house closes the door and there's no way to get in, then they begin to pound on the door and now they want access to the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, this lesson here is don't wait till it's too late.
Give God access to your soul today. Oh, Rama, there's going to come a day after the trumpet sounds when you won't fit the people in this church and every church in every country all around the world because people will see the error of their way, but it will be too late. Uh, but heaven is on sale. God is running a special. He said to whosoever will, all they have to do is come to me. Oh, Holy Ghost power. And so the wise, five were wise, five brides were foolish. The five that were wise took extra oil with them. The five that were foolish thought they deserved a trophy just for showing up. They felt entitled to other people's oil when they were negligent to bring the sufficient amount themselves. Five were wise. Five were trophy brides. Let me say something about the anatomy of a trophy bride. Trophy brides are those that I think uh, Wikipedia says it's someone who marries oftentimes someone much older than they are but has various financial assets and they are there to show that this uh, business mogul or famous person you know has uh, got him a trophy a prize the thing about trophy wives is this all they do all they're there for is appearance there's no relationship. Some people come to church just so they'll be seen as being church-going folk. Great for appearance, bad for relationship. Some moms and dads take their kids to Sunday school because they just think it's the right thing to do because they were taken to Sunday school. Looks good to the neighbors. But if there's no relationship with God, all it is is a facade. Now let me, I should have said this at the beginning. I'm not preaching to women today. I'm preaching to the bride of Christ. Do we want to be a trophy bride? Or do we want to have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Do we want to be grounded in love and reciprocal understanding? Or do we just want to look good? Or look the part? Oh, hallelujah. And so everybody learns lessons, even your pastor learns lessons. When I first came to pastor here in Greensboro, I was operating under a few misconceptions that God needed to get worked out of my spirit. First of all, I, I deeply underestimated the impact that being married to my wife and connected to my wife's family had on the success that we enjoyed on the evangelistic field. The Elms family has about 20 ministers licensed in the United Pentecostal Church all over the country. Her father and his brothers all pastored great churches all over the place. I married this woman not because she was the Elm, because she was just it, the will of God, okay? <laughs> but it just was an added piece of the deal but it opened doors for us. Now, first of all, I'm talking about me now. I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about me. And so in the evangelistic field, when you travel and you preach, there's kind of three tiers of traveling preachers. Number one, those that you, you can't ever get because they're so busy that all they preach is just a few select places and conferences, you know, like Lee Stone King and Richard Hurd was back in those days. Then there's the next set of preachers, and those are the ones that are successful evangelists to preach at all of the top churches in the movement, and we were there. Here's the problem with being there. Here's the problem with preaching week after week after week to churches that run 500, 800, 1,000. Names that you've all heard of. I think we've probably been to the, out of the top 20 churches in our fellowship. We've been to the 10 of them preaching revivals, okay? This is where you think. You think this is where I belong. You think this is where I fit. You think, I'm a big church kind of a preacher. 
And then when God calls you to a little church, kind of a church, that desperately needs someone to stay with them and help them keep afloat, and you find yourself staring at 10 or 15 or 20 or 30, Fred used to count them on Sunday night and Wednesday, 12, 13, 15. And sometimes the devil would jump on my shoulder and say, well, you've come a long way, baby. And I had to fall on my face in the presence of God and learn a lesson. It's not you are, you never were who you thought you were. You're who I'm going to make you into. You see, what you were becoming wasn't what I wanted from you. And so I'm taking you through an education course. And so I'm going to, I'm going to help you learn something. And I said, God, what is it that you need me to learn that I'm not good at? Are you ready for this? He said, you don't have a problem saying you're sorry for the mistakes you make. You don't have a problem repenting over your personal failures and sins, but I'm going to teach you how to repent over your successes. I'm going to show you how it doesn't matter to me where you've been and who you've preached for. What matters to me is are you humble and are you supple and are you pliable and can I shape you and can I make you into something useful? Oh, you say, isn't that sweet? Our pastor is repenting and apologizing for his own mistakes in front of God and everybody. I don't want you to pity me because I'm apologizing for my mistakes. I'm here to announce to you, I don't want to be a trophy bride. I don't want to just look good or sound good. I want to be what God wants me to be. And if it comes by way of sacrifice, then that's the way I'm willing to go to get there. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, open your hearts. In the name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The musicians are going to come. And so King Ahasuerus was one of the greatest rulers in the world at that time. He practically ruled over two continents. When you take the North Africa and you take India, these massive tracts of, 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 of lands, he was in control of all of it. And he threw a fe feast in order to impress all of the nobles. And the nobles gathered and they heaped upon him all the false praises. And they oohed in all, at all of his palace treasures. And they complimented on the quality of the wine. And they feasted and they partied. 180 days of nonstop revelry. And in the height of their inebriations, the king comes up with a plan. He sends word to Vashti, his queen. And he says, I want you to come and present yourself before the people. Some commentators said he told her, I want you to come wearing only the royal crown on your head, if you know what I mean. Here was the protocol of the Persians and the Mideastern kings when they would do these kinds of banquets. The wives of the nobles were welcome to be with them until the drinking started. But when the drinking started, the women folk were banished to other places in the palace so that the nobles could become drunk and, and they could then call for the brothel women to come in. And so what essentially was going on here was the king was asking Vashti to come in place of the prostitutes. And by virtue of her name, her name means beautiful woman. She had the gift of beauty and elegance. But more than that, she had the gift of depth of character. And the Bible says she refused to go in. She said, I'm not a trophy bride. I'm not... I'm not going to let you just love my body if you don't love my soul. 
And I want to hear, I want to tell you, yes, sometimes we do keep track of the numbers here only to challenge us to grow and to achieve more for God. But you're not a head count. You never were a head count and you never will be a head count. We're glad your body is here. But if that's all of you that's here, that's not enough. We want God to have you body, mind, and soul. And so by refusing the king's offer, she incited his wrath. And he banished her from the palace. And it cost her her marriage, her position, and possibly even her life. But oh, what little unknown Esther owed to the quality of character in a Gentile bride who said, you're not going to make a piece of meat out of me, buddy. Think of it. Vestai was a Gentile queen. The Gentile queen stood up for inner principles to pave the way for the orphan Jewish girl by the name of Esther to rise to the throne in her place. Israel's not there yet. But when Israel does arrive at a knowledge of who Jesus is, you know who she's going to have to thank for it? You and you and you and you and you who stood for basic godly principles and sound doctrine while Israel wandered away, amen, from the Messiah who came to reach them. But because we're willing, amen, to stand in the gap, one day we're, she's coming on board, amen, and we're all going to celebrate who Jesus is together. Aren't you glad, amen, that there's a Gentile bride? And this Gentile bride's not a superficial bride, but it's a bride of character and of honor and of dignity. She's not a cheap trophy. Hallelujah. I want us to stand. You're not a trinket. You're not a bauble. But you're a deep and personal and real companion. If you're not, you can be that. You know what? Maybe there's someone here that needs to just shirk off religion. And now it's time for a relationship. I always marvel at people when you talk about some, to some of offering them to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues. They shy away from it like it's poisonous. Wait a minute. If you felt God somewhere and someone offers you to feel God more powerfully than ever before, why should that be treated as if it's something to be avoided? Peter said the promise is to you, to your children, to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Jesus died so you could know him in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I want us to lift our hands right now. We're going to pray in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm telling someone, let go of religion and get a hold of God. I'm telling someone, quit looking like a Christian and be one. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Precious Lord, in Jesus' name. Precious Lord, in Jesus' name. Oh God, oh God. Come on, Pentecostals of Greensboro, who do we want to be? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't want to be a bride in name only. I want to have the spirit of the bridegroom in me. I'm opening these doors, I'm opening these altars, and I'm, I'm saying that God, God's kingdom's on sale. Would you come and get it? There's no obstruction. The door is not closing on anybody. The way is wide, and it's clear, and it's free, and it's for whosoever will. Mighty God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, there's room for everybody. If you've wondered about how to get an experience with God for yourself, come and pray with us. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord.
I'm running to the mercy seat.